future broadcast on our YouTube channel. Um, however, don't worry, you will not be recorded. Only those of us uh, unmuted and speaking into the, the yellow box will be recorded. Um, so as long as you stay muted, you're not part of that recording. Um, please do feel free to use the chat box uh, throughout the evening. If you have questions, Davith and I will be in there um, and we'll do our best to answer for you as we go. Um, and we will be putting into the chat box also um, for your convenience, a link to all of tonight's titles um, in a blog post on North Spire's website for your convenience when uh, trying to remember things later on. So that will be there. Um, and now I'm gonna turn things over to David. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, yeah, I've got the blog post actually right here. And there it is. Okay, that's in the chat. So, and we'll keep putting this up this evening. It's a link to all the titles uh, that our reps are gonna talk about this evening. Um, anyway, I, I'm also very excited about tonight. Um, these look like, I'm very excited about all these titles. These look, these look good. Um, our first uh, speaker tonight is Mike Katz, our, my friend. He's from uh, Independent Publishers Group and Publishers Group West. Uh, Mike, tell us about your books. Well, thank you, Dom. Thank you, Dom. It's, and I want to thank uh, everybody for coming tonight. Um, I am the New England field rep for Publishers Group West in Two Rivers Distribution. We distribute over 300 publishers. And uh, hopefully I've got about a dozen books I'd like to present tonight. Uh, one of our most important or most noted publishers is Grove Atlantic, known for its quality literary fiction, quality nonfiction, very, very deep classic backlist. And here's a few books from them. The first one, and I, I'm gonna go the old fashioned way, just show it on the screen. This is a book called Milk Blood Heat by Dantil Moniz, just recently released. Dantil is a relatively young African-American woman living in Florida. And she's written, this is her first collection of short stories. She uh, has had many stories uh, published in publications and other publications, but this is the first time they've been collected together. And they're just phenomenal, phenomenal stories. If you've ever spent time in Florida in the summer, that's what these stories are like. They're, they're heated. It's almost like there are lightning bolts all over you, flashes of lighting. You know, I read a lot of short story collections, some of them very good short story collections, but I often forget individual stories the next day. With Dentil, you cannot forget these stories. They stick with you for, well, for a while now. I've read them several weeks ago. And they're usually uh, and often centering on women and young girls working almost through a haze of, 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 of clouds and atmosphere. And they're just striking, striking stories. We've got a lot of great press so far for the book. Uh, and I really recommend it for anybody that really wants something that will challenge them and something that will be ultimately very rewarding. The next book, it's a book that I just recently finished called Good Girls, also now just released. This is also from Grove Atlantic, from Sonia Filario. She is an investigative reporter uh, centered. She writes often about India. This book, Good Girls, which is nonfiction, by the way, is a very famous case in India, not as well known in the West or not as well known in the United States, about three young, I'm sorry, two young girls, uh, Lali and Pabda, who were uh, first cousins, inseparable. In fact, when in, whenever people talked about them, they conjoined their two names. Um, they lived side by side in a very, very poor town, six, oh, I'd say about six hours from Delhi. One night, and these are houses, they're so poor, there are no bathrooms. They would go out in the, in the fields to uh, relieve themselves. They both went out late at night, did not return. The next morning were found hung from a tree. What's incredible about the story, and yes, it is, uh, I'm not gonna give away, no spoil alert here. What's incredible about the story is the families would not take down the bodies for over a day. They did not trust the authorities, they did not trust the police. And by the way, the police were all drunk all the time. And originally, we, everyone would think, and you would think as you read the book, that they died in a certain way, but completely, completely different than you would think. 
It's just amazing feats. Let me show you the cover again. It's a very beautiful cover. This is the galley, by the way. This is the paperback, but it's out in hardcover now. And it's, and it's like I said, it's already been released, although it's a February publication. And Ms. Ms. Falerio really does an incredible job of this. Yes, I believe it was just reviewed in the New York Times. It's got a lot of strong reviews. No, it's not an easy book to read, but uh, I don't know much about India, but my knowledge of India probably comes, like a lot of you, from watching Slumdog Millionaire. Well, this is not Slumdog Millionaire. This really shows the caste system, the poverty in India, and the distrust of authority, and just an incredible book. I really, really liked it. The third book, and the first book of a Vermont author, and I don't have a copy of it because I gave away all my galleys and it's not published yet, is End Papers by Alexander Wolf. Now, Mr. Wolf lives, I think, part-time in Cornwall, which is near Middlebury. And his grandfather, Kurt Wolf, was the founder of Pantheon Publishing, one of the most reputable publishing houses in this country. Uh, it's an imprint of Random House. Kurt Wolf left Nazi Germany, just as the Nazis were taking over, and came to the United States and founded Pantheon. What's, what's great about the book is that it not only is it a really interesting look at the publishing world, but it's a really amazing look at that period in time. Now, my father was, I mean, in fact, I'm an immigrant myself. I was born in Italy, but my father survived, he escaped from the Nazis, survived in the hills with his five sisters and his parents, the hills of Italy, uh, throughout the war. Well, this is a, an amazing look of what, go, what went on at that time. And I, I'm not going to read too many quotes because I don't have that much time. But this is from Becky Dayton, who is the owner of Vermont Bookshop. And she wrote this. I have put off writing this review because Wolf has been my next door neighbor for nearly 25 years, a fact which has made me worry that my praise would be perceived as disingenuous or worse solicited. Neither is the case. And with the gravest sincerity, I have to declare this is the best book I read in 2020. A blend of personal memoir and history, end papers is in equal parts beguiling and informative. Wolf manages through telling his own family's unique story to make the fraught history of World War II era Germany a deeply personal matter. The bits about his father's role in publishing will interest the most bookish readers, but all the rest will move the masses. Just a phenomenal review, and I really appreciate Becky for writing that. And it's really worth it. Now that's coming out, I think, not sure, it's, it's down in here somewhere, probably in, uh, I believe it's next month or early March. Uh, in fact, yes, March 2nd is the publication date, so the end of next month. Now a book that's now coming in paperback, a lot of you probably know this book, but I had to include it, is Lily King's last novel, Writers and Lovers. I've read every book by Lily King except for her first book. And this is as good as they get. Um, it's kind of a throwback to some of her earlier books, a contemporary novel about a young woman named Casey. She is a struggling writer, works in a restaurant. She's dealing with the grief of her mother who has recently passed away suddenly, a young, young mother. And um, she's kind of, uh, what's it, yo-yoing between two men. And it's really just a great look at, uh, and I'm a man and I love the book, but it's a great, I think, book club book. It's a great book for women. It's a great book for anybody because her character and all the characters of the book are so real. And it's a great look, by the way, of Boston and Cambridge in the 1990s. So I highly recommend it. It's now in paperback. It's already been released. This is, again, is by Galley, but the paperback looks very much like this book. Uh, next book, Europa is another publisher of ours. Europa does, yeah, they're out of Italy. Um, they don't only do books in translation, they do a lot of books in English, but they're known for, among other things, Elena Ferrante's books. But this is a book that's also just recently released, Ben Hopkins Cathedral. It is a tome, as you can tell. It's over 600 pages long. It, it looks at the building of a cathedral in 13th and 14th century Germany. Um, very much reminiscent of Ken Follett or Umberto Eco. And it really looks at the people involved with building this cathedral, the way society was changing from a basically land-based economy to a more mercantile economy, uh, all along with the cathedral being built, which of course, as you know, takes a long time. And there's also a great section about the Black Plague in it. So there's some current relevance as well. Highly recommend it. Uh, anybody that likes Ken Follett will like this. 
next, what do we have here? Um, oh, Untamed Shore. Now, last year, there was a surprise bestseller from Valentine Books from Sylvia Moreno Garcia called Mexican Gothic. It was a horror story set in Mexico. Now, I, let me see if I can find the cover for it. Here we go. This, I don't have a copy of the book. Um, that was a surprise bestseller, book that did very well. We just happened from a small publisher called Angora, we just happened to have her earlier book, Untamed Shore, which again is set in Mexico. It's not as much of a horror novel, but it's more of a thriller. A young woman who's bored living on the shore in Baja, watching the fishermen pull in dead sharks when she comes across three very attractive uh, rich American tourists and gets involved. Well, it doesn't go well. And we found out very quickly that those sharks, when they're alive, are no match for what happens to our, our, our heroine. Next book, another Vermont author, The Hare, Melanie Finn. Melanie Finn has written several novels, including The Gloaming. She's very good with with women in distress. And in this case, a woman with her young child is stranded, well, stranded, more or less imprisoned in a cabin in the Vermont woods and taken semi-prisoner by her con man boyfriend. And it's very, very tough to read. I would say, I shouldn't say it's tough to read. It's a harrowing adventure, but it's really worth reading. Uh, Melanie lives near Burlington. And this is coming out. Uh, this is out right now in hardcover, I believe. Next on my list, and you can see there's a lot of different publishers. And by the way, that is from $2 Radio, one of my smaller publishers, but they do a great job with a lot of their books. Milkweed um, is another publisher of mine, known very much for uh, our big bestseller from last year, Braiding Sweetgrass. But this is a book called The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson. Diane Wilson is a member of the Dakota tribe, set in Dakota. And it really looks at generations of, of, of women, especially generations of families, their connection with each other, connection with the land, and the connection with seeds to keep that connection with their land. Um, highly recommended. Robin Kimmerer, the author of, of uh, Brady Sweetgrass, said, with compelling characters and images that linger long after the final pages turn, the Seed Keeper invokes the strength that women, land, and plants have shared with one another through the generations. Another book I recommend. Now, this is coming out uh, soon, publication date in March. And that is a, I believe it's a, actually a paperback, but uh, don't, uh, yes, it's a paperback of $16. Next book, another book from um, Milkweed and also a New England author. She teaches at Bennington College. Deirdre McNamara, a book called Aviary. This is my favorite. I don't know if you can see it really well, but this is my favorite cover of my whole list. Gorgeous cover. This is coming out in hardcover in April, so it'll probably release at the end of March. Aviary is set in a uh, retirement home. And rarely do you have books that really focus on older people, which now that I'm getting to that age, I, I really respect that. But the characters in the retirement home are fabulous. There is a fire in the home, an investigator comes, and people disappear, people come together. Uh, it's really well done. And uh, she has a great promising future. And as I said, she teaches at Bennington. Another, I believe, is another novel, although this is the novel from Godin, is a publisher out of Boston. And Night Came with Many Stars for Simon Van Bui. I gave this to one of my accounts a couple of weeks ago. She wrote back to me last week and said, I could not put it down. This is an incredible, incredible book. The first chapter, and it starts with a young 13-year-old girl, set in 1933, by the way. Uh, I believe it's Kentucky. A young 13-year-old girl living with her father in a really dilapidated farm. He loses her, literally loses her in a card game and has to give her away. And the book traces her life from then on in. There's a strong hint of magic realism through the book, but it's done beautifully. 
It doesn't overwhelm you with the magic. Uh, characters come in and out of the young lady's life and just beautiful book. And I'm very, very happy about this. I mean, Godin has done a really nice job. We've had it for a couple of seasons. They're doing a great job with some of their fiction. And I have two children's books. Both of these are coming out soon. I don't want to go. The first one is On the Other Side of the Forest. You can see that. There we go. A really gorgeous book. It is a rabbit and his son who live in an impenetrable forest, a forest that you do not want to go through, a forest of hidden dangers. But the father especially and both really want to look at what is out there, what is outside this forest. So they concoct the scheme for building a tower. And this gives you an idea of some of the illustrations in the book. They build a tower and I won't give it away, but they find out what's outside there. But what's gorgeous about the book, especially gorgeous is the illustrations really remind me of Beatrix Potter. They're fabulous, fabulous illustrations. This is from Greystone. This is the same publisher that brought you or brought us the Hidden Life of Trees. And they're doing a really nice job with their new kids imprint. And this is one of the books on that kids imprint. Um, this is coming out relatively soon. I would say, yep, in March. Uh, just, just a gorgeous book. I wish, you know, normally if I was presenting books in person, I could show you the, the book and you could put your hands in it. This is the paperback. This is the galley or um, 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 FNG, we call it, Fold and Gathered. But this will be coming out in hardcover. And my last book, also a children's book, also from Greystone, is the Capybaras. Capybaras, if you don't know, are the largest living rodent in the world. They can grow up to four feet long and over 100 pounds. Uh, they live basically in South America in, the, uh, in, in, in estuaries and in the rivers. Well, this book, I mean, get a load of these guys. So they're not the cutest things ever. These capybaras, who, by the way, live in groups of 10 to 20 at a time, want to live, decide to, they want to live with these chickens. Well, the chickens uh, really don't think this is a very good idea, but eventually they come to accommodation. And at some point, it looks like the capybaras and the chickens lead a revolt and they all escape. Um, but it's really magically done. The illustrations, let me show you some more illustrations. The or illustrations are gorgeous, a really, really nice picture book. Uh, again, this is from Greystone, like I said, and this is coming out in hopefully sometime soon, so you can get your hands on it. I believe it's uh, April, so it'll be coming out near uh, March. Uh, I hear somebody wants to know my name again, but again, my name is Mike Katz, uh, New England rep for Publishers Group West and Two Rivers Distribution, but I'm sure Davith will include that in the chat. Uh, thank you all, and uh, uh, I get it back to you, Davith. Thanks, Mike. I was just trying to type that very quickly, but I'm a slow typer. Uh, I'll get to it in just a moment. Um, so thank you so much, Mike. A number of those titles uh, I was looking at today when I was making the blog post look do really look um, very exciting. Uh, next up, we have Karen Corvello. She's going to be discussing a few new titles coming out from Yale University Press and Princeton University Press. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am the East Coast rep for Yale and for Princeton. And um, Princeton, I'll start with Princeton. They're known for um, economics books, uh, some books on politics, science. Um, Albert Einstein is a big deal at Princeton. Um, and a, a small but growing art list. And I am going to be slightly more technically adept than Mike, but way less than Emily. So. You're going to um, see my Edelweiss screen. So the first book I'm talking about is Breaking the Social Media Prism, How to Make Our Platforms Less Polarizing. And this is looking at politi political polarization. Um, Christopher Bale asks, why don't people become more moderate when exposed to opposing political viewpoints? So as you know, this is clearly topical. Um, Bale is director of the Polarization Lab at Duke. 
Um, in this book, he discusses how social media renders moderates invisible. Basically, people at either um, end are, are screaming at each other and moderates' voices just disappear. He describes his online experiments, interviews with Facebook and Twitter users. He offers solutions to counter extremism. He discusses apps and bots like truth apps and um, talks about how to engage in better com online conversations. Uh, the profit paradox, how thriving firms threaten the future of work. There's a lot in this book um, about Amazon as, as you would imagine. Um, so he's, um, Jan Ekout is another um, economist and he's looking at how prices rise, but wages don't. So big, big businesses have benefited from economic gains. Large firms gobble up small firms. There's less competition, yet prices still rise. Um, he's been published in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. So I expect that there will be some um, media interest in this. Uh, for a little change of topic, delicious, uh, the evolution of flavor and how it made us human. This looks at how the pursuit of flavor makes us human. So there's great stories from prehistoric times all the way up to today from all around the world. Uh, things like the role of taste and flavor, uh, the role that taste and flavor play in decisions that chimps make and the tools that they invent. He talks about how mammoth meat was actually pretty tasty. I'm not sure how he figured that out. Um, he talks about the, um, he, I should say they, talk about the origin of spices, uh, the fermentation of fruits and roots. So it's, it's a very fun book, fabulous cover. This is one of my favorite books on the Princeton list, Fears of a Setting Sun, The Dis Disillusionment of American's Founders. So this is a story how, about how the American founders, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Hamilton grew increasingly pessimistic about the future of, um, of America and the future of the Constitution. This is very readable. It's definitely trade history. Um, and there's not a lot of books that, on this topic. Um, so uh, Rasmussen talks about Washington was concerned, how he was concerned about the rise of parties and partisanship. Hamilton felt that the federal government was not vigorous and energetic enough. Adams um, thought that the American people lacked civic virtue. And Jefferson was concerned about uh, sectional divisions caused by uh, slavery. Um, this did get a starred PW review. So again, very excited about this. Then we have two books in our Pedia series. I hope you remember um, a book that came out a year ago called Fungipedia. Um, now we have two more, Floripedia and Birdpedia. And these are uh, counter books, 1695 hardcover, cloth, stamped cover. And they're just brief, really fun, lovely, um, little fun facts about flowers and uh, birds. So I'll show you a cute, it's, it's like a mini um, encyclopedia. Um, very lovely, people snap them up. I think you sold 16 of um, Fungipedia. So these do really well for you. Um, the Trees of Life, um, this book is gorgeous. Um, over 200 illustrations photos of um, and paintings of 80 of the world's uh, most amazing trees. And it's interesting, it's organized by virtue they impart. Uh, so the first part talks about cork and rubber trees. Then they talk about trees that um, can be used to make dyes and perfumes and medicines. Uh, of course, they talk about fruit trees and nut trees. They talk about super trees and trees that help create a, a healthy planet. And I do want to show you the last photo because it's just really incredible. Oh, well, that's beautiful too, but um, it's, it's really, really stunning. Um, 
and that's $29.95, so pretty good price. Next is Nature's Palette. Uh, this is an expanded edition of Werner's Nomenclature of Colors uh, from 1814, which you probably haven't heard of, I hadn't. Um, this is a, a taxonomically organized guide to color in the natural world. And the 18, um, the original book Charles Darwin took with him on his voyage on the Beagle. Uh, this has new illustrations of plants, animals, and minerals that are referenced alongside with the color swatches. So you can see there how beautiful it is. There's, um, it's over a thousand illustrations, um, eight gatefolds, really beautiful. And if you're still um, selling color books, I think this will work for you. 30, again, 39.95, a good price. So now we're moving on to Yale University Press and Yale um, is known for um, politics, history, um, and they do have a really good art list. They publish a lot of books with the Met. Uh, the first book is Why the New Deal Matters by Eric Rochway. Um, and this is looking at how the New Deal um, changed our relationship to politics economics and each other, and how the effects are still being felt today. So it's very timely. Um, many people are grappling with similar economic circumstances as those that led to the New Deal. Um, and there's a lot of things from the, the uh, that were uh, created um, during the New Deal that are still with us today. Things like uh, civic buildings, bridges, national parks, um, small business loans, um, minimum wage, and unemployment. Those are all from the New Deal. So this discusses both the positive and some of the not so positive aspects. There is a chapter in there on concessions that were made to the segregation of South to get the New Deal passed. A Another stunning book, Rosa, The Story of the Rose. This isn't um, really a gardening book. This is a um, really a cultural history of the rose. So it is illustrated throughout. It's very beautiful. Um, it looks at the role of the rose in archaeology, mythology, literature, poetry. Um, the author used to uh, work at uh, the New York Botanical Garden. He did a lot of work on the Peggy Rockefeller uh, Rose Garden, which got covered in the New York Times. Um, the book is beautiful and um, just a nice um, trim size, $30. So I love this book. Another timely book, Reclaiming Patriotism and an Age of Extremes by Stephen Smith. So he's looking at how um, the question of how do we love our country without descending into dangerous nationalism. Um, so the concept of patriotism has fallen on hard times. Um, it's been very much politicized by both sides. Smith describes um, ideal patriotism as a matter of both the head, the intellect and the heart. And it should be broad enough to include, um, to balance loyalty to country against other loyalties and include everybody. And very happy to say that Bugsy Siegel, this got reviewed in the New York Times today, yay. Um, and the, the line I took from the intro of this is that Bugsy Siegel was Gatsby with a penchant to kill. Um, so he was a, um, Gangster, born in Brooklyn in poverty, um, was one of the um, one of the folks that actually helped invent Las Vegas, um, and he ended up um, shot to death, probably a well deserved death, um, at forty one in, um, in in Vegas. So uh, very readable. Um, he certainly had a juicy life. Um, so. And then 
then we get to just a couple of art books, Alice Neal, People Come First. Um, there's an exhibition at the Met that just opened. And um, this looks at um, her work as a champion of civil rights movement and a champion of um, kind of just humans in, in general. Um, she did a lot of um, portraits of victims of the Great Depression, uh, fellow residents of Spanish Harlem, leaders of political organizations. She had communist leanings, um, queer artists, uh, visibly pregnant women, which was something that was um, unusual. Um, so gorgeous book um, and um, she is due for a renaissance. So I hope this book helps. And then the last book I will show you is Nikolai Astrup, Visions of Norway. Um, this is an exhibition at the Clark that will be opening in June. You may not know him. He is not well known in this country yet. He's a Norwegian artist and um, he was a painter, a printmaker, and a horticulturist. And I think a lot of the, the landscapes echo um, the landscapes of um, Vermont, minus the fjords. Uh, very beautiful stuff. He's due to be rediscovered and just gorgeous. So thank you all very much. And anyone who wants a comp copy of anything, just let me know. I love sending books to booksellers. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, as I said, I, I, I'm super excited about the Bunny Siegel biography that I'm gonna, um, it's on the, my next on the to be read list. Um, well, thank you so much. And uh, next we have Emily Servone from Chronicle Books. Servone, Servone. Either one, either way works. Whichever Hi one. everyone. Um, I'm not terribly, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm not terribly, stuck on how to pronounce my last name because it's my married last name and I don't know I was holding before and that's an easy one to say um so let me just pull up my presentation um for those who missed what Duffy just said um I am Emily Servone oh see I, I figured out how to do this fancy thing um I'm Emily Servone I'm from Chronicle Books um my publisher is based out of San Francisco but we publish uh cookbooks kids books gift product you name it we do it. Um, it's kind of insane how much we do, to be honest. Um, we also distribute a lot of um, cookbook publishers from Australia, one from Australia, one from the UK, um, another, a couple of from the UK. We do Princeton Architectural Press, which used to be mostly architecture books, and now they do a lot of really great kids books and um, other books. So I tried to represent as many people here as I could. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so these are some cool books you should check out. I did a nice mix of um, ones that are already out and available and then some that are coming soon and that you can pre-order with Northshire. Um, so first on our list is coming out this March. This is Mango and Peppercorns. Um, this is a memoir cookbook mashup. And I think it's such a cool format that you, you don't see that many that are in a nice, um, what we call trim size, so a nice size that you can easily hold and sit and read. Um, think of, if you do any food write, food reading, food writing reading, uh, think of Ruth Reichel's My Kitchen Year, so it's, it's a nice size, not this big. So Tung Nguyen was a refugee from Vietnam about 50 years ago, um, and she managed to come over as a refugee, and in a time that was not only difficult for refugees, but for immigrants and women to start their own business, she managed to uh, found her restaurant and become incredibly successful. So this is just a wonderful book um, about uh, some great accomplishments she's made, um, creating like basically living the American dream um, in a way that you don't necessarily think you are going to as a refugee. Um, it includes 20 recipes, a really wonderful, wonderful story. And it does have a nice section in the middle with pictures. So you can um, see what her life was like and what she was going through. Um, this comes out March 16th and uh, you can order it now. It's going to be great. Then we have uh, for something a little bit more fun, a little more comical, a little more gifty. At the end of April, uh, Goodbye Salad Days, Kevin Faces Adulthood comes out. 
So I think everyone can relate to Kevin a little bit. Uh, he's a very earnest little hamster just trying to get through adulthood. Um, and, you know, navigating adulthood is kind of, it's funny, it's hard, it's difficult, and everyone could use a little book that brings joy into their life. Um, so this is a great little gift book. Um, so you can follow Kevin as he navigates all the steps of adulthood from home ownership to uh, trying to keep houseplants alive to having to mentor the young newbies at work. Um, and then this, it's great. Like, I just, I think this book is so funny. Um, Trayer Scott, the author um, and photographer, usually does these really big, beautiful books that feature um, portraits of animals. And I believe this was what something she was doing with her kids during the beginning of COVID is kind of like a, a distraction. And it turned into just a really great book that's going to be very funny. Um, I think this is a great gift for pretty much everyone, but especially yourself in this time when you need a little more humor in your life. So pre-order that now if you're interested. Uh, okay, so this one is out now. It came out last fall. And this is a new take on a beloved classic. So I'm pretty sure ma majority of the people on this call have read Pride and Prejudice. I think we've all had to read it. But what's cool about this edition is it includes 19 physical letters. So there are 19 letters that are written in the book, if you've read it, between people. So what we have done is taken those letters out of the text and created actual handwritten letters and hand folded letters and reinserted them into the part of the book. So you get this great little collection of letters that go with it. Um, and it's a great interactive book. It's perfect for literature lovers and for Janeites, which is the actual term for people who love Jane Austen books. So you can see here how it's all comes together and where the letter would appear in the book. And there's a little, it's like, unfortunately you can't see me point because I'm on a screen, but there's a little, a little envelope where the letter goes into. Um, the book will come, does come shrink wrapped so that you, none of the letters will get lost in the store. But I think it really adds a great interactive um, aspect, element to a book that is such a classic. And that, so it adds a new level to rereading the book. Um, we're, we saw a lot of success with this at Christmas time, and I think this makes another great book uh, for a gift. And we are coming out with a Little Women um, version of like like this in the fall, and we're hoping to do more because I think it's I just think it's great. And you can see how beautiful it is. Okay, let's talk more cookbooks. Um, so Finding Fire is actually a book that we released initially in 2018, and it did super well. In fact, Northshire. Um, sold as many as they could because we could not keep it in stock. Um, I remember their, their buyer and I were literally emailing probably every other day trying to get this book because uh, people just really, like, really wanted it and we could not get it. So since 2018, um, Lennox Hasty, the author, was actually featured on Net the Netflix series Chef's Table Barbecue with his restaurant. And they were fan favorites. So Hardy Grant, the publisher, decided that they were going to reissue this book at $5 less. That's only $35, which is great. Has a new, a little more eye-catching cover. Um, and it's it's a smaller size. So it's a little easier to hold and to like, you know, put on your counter where you're trying to cook than a little bit less wieldy. Um, and it makes a really great Father's Day gift and Mother's Day gift because you know there's mothers out there who definitely are grillers. Um, and it's great because it features both savory and um, sweet recipes, which I never thought about making a baked good that features uh, like cake, so a, or a sweet element, so like or grilled element rather. So like a blood orange upside down cake using grilled oranges is amazing. And then um, it has seafood, it has meat, it has vegetarian stuff. So it's, it's such a great book for anyone who's looking for a really good book a grilling book that does more than just like grilling. And that is out now, so you can get that. And also out now, this came out last month, uh, Voices of Change. This is a 200 years of, quote, of, of transformative and empowering words from activists in one quote book. And it's wonderful. There's so much going on in this book. It's really timely for the world we're living in. So it has quotes from everyone from Susan B. Anthony to Colin Kaepernick to Harriet Tubman to Mother Jones to Greta Thunberg. You name it, they're in this book. 
Um, and I think it can be enjoyed over and over again. There's great photos throughout um, that, you know, that show lots of history. There's other um, images and it's just, it's a very simple book. I love the, the color palette. Very simple, very easy. It's, I believe it's only about $16.95. So it's a great impulse buy or a great thing that you can just put on your coffee table, a little book and have whenever you need a little bit of reminder that um, activism is great and we should all stand up for um, the courage that we need and what we believe in. Also out now and another really great gifty book and I'm gonna like shift my head a little bit so you can see her uh, her name. So this is from Nicole Tersingi, I believe is how you say it. So this is another timely book, but in another, in a different kind of way. Um, this book kind of exam takes, um, takes all those great things that no offense dudes on the call, um, mansplainers might say, and put them against classic art. So you will laugh, women especially will laugh, but I think men will really laugh at this too. Um, it's just a, such a great book about um, exactly what it says about women having to deal with men. Um, so like this one, the mansplainer says, let me explain your lived experience to you. Um, this one talks about, like one of them talks about um, telling the woman how to breastfeed best a man. And it's, it's, it's timely and it's funny and Nicole's funny. And it was actually based on a really popular Twitter thread. Um, and I know that not everyone's gonna find humor in it. I personally think it's hilarious. I definitely had some bookstore booksellers did not find it funny, but they are wrong because it is very funny. It is a great gift. Um, and, you know, there's going to be more from Nicole. She's fantastic. So very snarky, but not, but not necessarily mean. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about some kids books now because we do a lot of kids books and adult books. So we're going to start with a book we have coming out um, in May. So Have You Ever Seen the Flowers by Sean Harris. And Sean is an award-winning um, illustrator. He's done books with Dave Eggers and other amazing, um, amazing writers. And I think, I believe this is his debut picture book. So I, I think this is one of the most beautiful books. I love the color palette. I love um, the little girl in the front. Uh, I love that there's a dog, which I actually, I just think having a dog in, in a book is a very excellent addition to any picture book. Um, so this is a great, it starts as an exploration of what it means to be a flower, what it means to be human, but truly it's about what it means to be alive. And what's great about this kind of picture book or any, any picture book really, but what's great about this book is because it is a book, you can take that exploration and you can bring it anywhere. And it's really just about um, having imagination and, and understanding and wanting to do the exploration. So a child can read this book anywhere and understand what it's like to be, to live, to be alive and what everything means. And I mean, look at the artwork is just absolutely stunning. Um, I, I see, I think this one has some real award potential. I think we're going to see it a lot of places. Um, this age group, this is, I would say, um, it's young enough for like a young, like I probably, five, six, even younger um, could read it because he writes it in a very easy to read, understandable way. So it's not no, not too complex words, not too complex with theories, but um, kids can enjoy it. I mean, I think sometimes picture books that have this kind of message are aimed at a slightly older kid just because they want to understand, so they can understand what's going on. But I do think even the youngest kid can really appreciate this. So then we have probably my favorite book of the spring. Uh, this is Popcorn Bob. So coming this April, Popcorn Bob uh, is about a sentient piece popcorn kernel um, that is looking for justice in his new home with his new BFF, Ellis. Um, her school has banned junk food and so have her dad's. And so she's like, all right. So he's like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna have justice. So what's, um, so this book is actually brought to you by the editor that introduced Harry Potter to America. Um, and it is the perfect, like, it is amazing. So Arthur, the author, the editor, um, loves this book. And we have three books coming in the series, at least so far. And if he can bring Harry Potter to America, I'm pretty sure he's gonna make Popcorn Bob happen. So when uh, the tricky farmer Bill uses this illegal fertilizer to treat his corn crop, he accidentally creates the greatest hero of our time, Popcorn Bob. And um, it's just, it's such a funny book. It's illustrated throughout. 
along with the text. So even though it's a chapter book, it's made for these kids, um, as Rachel said in the chat, for ages seven to 12. So it's perfect for these emerging readers um, versus like, so someone who's a little beyond the early chapter books where they're learning to read, but someone who's not quite fully to a full chapter book yet. And I, I, I love little elements in this book. Like um, you can see on the left here, the Popcorn Paradise chapter page opener is Ellis loves doing handstands and they even make her dialogue upside down. Um, and that, but it's just, it's so fun. It's so silly. Every time Bob gets like really, really angry because he has a little bit of a short temper, he actually pops into a piece of popcorn. Um, and it's, it's really funny. Um, I also love that it has some casual inclusivity in that Ellis is, has two dads. Um, and it's not, there's not, it's not a big deal. It's not like, it's not a book about her having two dads. She just happens to. And I think that's an important element that we should see in more kids books is that casual, um, that casual inclusivity where it's perfectly natural. So the book takes place in the Netherlands. Um, the third book will come to America and we're very excited. So I hope that you all, if this, you have a kid um, or even you yourself, an adult wanna read this book, pre-order it, it's great. Um, and I think it's gonna be a hit, honestly. I think this is going to be very, very big. Um, and then we have a nut. So this is another picture book that I think is really special. Um, so the four questions is, uh, it came out initially in 1988. Um, and then it hasn't been in publication for a long time. So Levine Cuerto, which is the publisher that did this one and Popcorn Bob, um, it picked it up and they're re-releasing it. And it's the perfect book for introducing kids to Passover. And what's nice about um, this is it's not just aimed at Jewish children. It's really for anyone who wants to learn more about Passover and the traditions involved in Passover. Um, so the four questions for those who are not aware are the traditionally asked of the youngest uh, child or the youngest attendee at the, the Passover Seder. And what's nice about this edition is it's made to lay flat on the table so it, during dinner so that everyone can look at it. Plus it's written in both Hebrew and um, English. So all you have to do is flip over the book and you can see here, you can see that we have the English here, the Hebrew here. And if you flip over the book, even the images flip over. And it's, I think this is just a very, very special book. Um, it really has a long shelf life. I mean, this is a classic. And I think what's nice about it is, as I said, it's not just for Jewish children. It's really for anyone who wants to learn more. Plus it's just, it's a beautiful piece of art. Um, and I think people will love it. And then last but not least, um, we have probably one of my favorite books that we've ever published. This is also from Le Levine Queerdo, which I, they, so their first season, their first, um, yeah, in the fall was the first time they, they just started as a company. And they had dozen, like almost every book on their list got um, an award, which is amazing. So Alatsue is about um, a indigenous girl. She's light being Apache and she lives in Texas, but the author herself does spend time in Connecticut. Um, so her cousin is mysteriously murdered. And um, so she sets her and her parents and her friends, and she has a, a dog that's a ghost, um, set up to find the killer and bring her cousin some peace. And it's interesting because, so it, it's a it's an alternate America in which magic exists. So there's vampires and there's fae, and um, there's a lot of magic, um, especially the indigenous people. Um, and so you learn, so you're also learning about some of these indigenous traditions or stories that uh, without it being like, I'm reading a book that is all folklore, it's literally taking our actual society and adding magic to it. So it's magical realism, but the, in the best possible way. Um, and there's like, there's definitely some murder mystery aspects to it. Like there's, it takes place in Texas on the lands that belong to the life in Apache, but then this weird town that they're in Willoughby is like, you're in the middle of New England. Like Texas is going through a drought, yet this town is very green and there's lots of mushrooms and there is a mystery and um, there's a lot of dream travel and, and uh, a lots of way herself can actually raise um, ghosts from the dead and you don't raise people because they don't ever come back right. Um, so that's how she has her her dog. But it's it it's really fun. I actually just finished it last night, um, and it was amazing. And I I I love it. It has beautiful artwork throughout. And I think Darcy, uh, the author Darcy Little Badger, is going to be really really big. Um, this was her debut novel, and it was voted the best book of the year by all of the people you can see. Um, 
Chicago Public Library, NPR, Booklist, Kirkus Reviews, the Boston Globe, PW, Bookpage, BuzzFeed, Tor, and the Time, it was voted, not only voted best book of the year by Time, Time Magazine actually voted it as one of the best fantasy novels of all time. Um, and it's a debut book and it's amazing. So we're really excited um, to have Darcy as an author that is really, she's really gonna take off. And if you have not heard of this book or read this book, get a copy. It is amazing. It is so, so interesting and so good. And something I didn't actually put in my presentation, but I find really interesting is the character of um, Latsue is um, asexual, which is a very, very minor part in the book. They casually mention it, it's casually there. Um, and I think that's a really, it's really great because so many of these YA middle grade um, novels always have this element of like, oh, does he like me or does she like me like this? Will they, won't they? And she has a best friend who's a dude, but you never wonder if there's like a crush going on. It, and it focuses on the family and it focuses on the story versus focusing on this romance that doesn't need to be there. And I really liked that about this book. I think it really added an element that make that'll make a lot of kids um but like it because they don't have to you know especially for sometimes it's hard to get boys to read books that have girls in the cover which is a thing that I'm we're you know everyone's trying to work around um and that's nice that there doesn't have to be that romance element so there is an attraction for every gender and every person and that is it for me um thank you so much um I hope that you saw something that you're interested in and something that you like um thanks a lot you to all of our reps those were some amazing presentations i know that my list of things i need to read has just gotten massively longer i think i'm not the only one of those um, in that in that situation um, so mike karen and emily thank you all so much um, audience uh, we have put again the um the link to the blog post that has um all, all of these titles in them into the chat um, it also was in your confirmation email um, or your email today, sorry, that you got with the um, the link for the, the, the Zoom. So you can go back to it there um, for future browsing, shopping, or reminding yourself of titles that you can't do. What, what was the book again? Um, you'll find it there. You can also always email myself and Davith at events at northshire.com and we are happy to help out. Um, we'll be back tomorrow night with great historical fiction with Ariel Lawson, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, in conversation with Kim Van Alkamada, two North Star favorites talking historical fiction. Um, and then on Thursday for the actor and comedian, Michael Ian Black, talking about his uh, semi-serious letter to his son called A Better Man. Um, so please join us for those and we'll see you all again real soon. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening. <laughs>